promise to show you why we might think perpendicular slope should multiply to b minus 1. I also wanted to talk more about average rate of change. So that's the content of this slide. Um, so here we have a line. And we're going to construct a line perpendicular to it. But first, we're going to look and see how you would compute the slope of this line. I'm doing this. So slope is rise over run. And I don't know exactly what to write here. So I, I want to call these things. So I'll call this, this A and this B, I guess. Here we're thinking A is positive because it's change in X. So a positive number. And B is negative. Just to keep it straight. And the slope is change in Y, which is B, a negative value over A. So it's a negative slope. We know that. And then we're going to take this whole picture and we're going to rotate it to make something perpendicular. OK, here goes. Not so easy. That's supposed to be perpendicular. And this point here will end up up here, like that. We'll just copy the whole picture. So as we move from this point to this point, the change in x was positive, the change in uh, y was negative. Here's that positive number, here's that negative number. Now as we move from the same companion point to here, here's the change in, now it's the change in y. And here's the change in x. The arrows come right along with it. But this a here was positive, this a here is negative. So if A was positive, I'm going to call this minus A. The change in Y as you move between the two points is negative because it goes from up here to down here. And then B was negative because you're going down. Here B is negative because you're going left. So I can use the same B to represent the change in X. I'm going from here to here. The change in X is negative, just like the change in Y was negative. But the change in Y, well, the change in X was positive, but now the change in Y, which corresponds to it, has to be negative, so I have to do minus that, but I keep this the same. So here the slope is minus A over B. And then we look at the product of the slopes, B over A times minus A over B, we get minus 1. So more or less what happens when you rotate 90 degrees, the change in X becomes a change in Y. The change in Y becomes a change of X. So when you look at the slopes, it was B over A, now it's A over B, at least in size. And then you know if you start it off negative, it's going to end up positive. So there's some kind of reciprocal. In addition to that, when you take the perpendicular, a negative slope becomes a positive slope. But we found out why. It's because the, some of these changes change sign, other ones don't. So that's a quick explanation of why perpendicular slopes uh, multiply to b minus 1. We don't need to know that to use it, but it's nice to see that there's some geometry behind it, just taking right triangles and turning them. I think that's kind of nice. Over here, we're going to look at a graph of a trip, distance versus time graph. And I'm not exactly sure where we're driving to, but this is how it looks. So as in the first hour, this is a zero point, you travel 25 miles. In the second hour, so I'm thinking you'll go pretty fast. You're going to go 75 miles in that second hour. So you've already come 25. So now you're up there at 100. And then in the third hour, you're going to travel 50 miles, which are here. So you were at 100. Now in an hour, so we're thinking, right? This is 25 here. So we went 25, then we went 75, and then we went, in theory, 50 up to 150. So I better label this and we'll lose track of where we are. 3, 150, like that. 2, 100, like that. And here's 1, 25. Like that. So the first hour you went 25 miles, and then you went 75 more, and 
by the time you got to the second hour, and then you went 50 more by the time you went to the third hour. And let's just suppose you're at your destination, but you have to sit there for an hour. Fine. So maybe you show up at your friend's house. They're not home. You can't get them on the phone. So you're just sitting outside their house in your car waiting for them for an hour. They didn't expect you to get there that fast because they knew the traffic was bad, whatever. And you ask yourself, well, what average speed would be needed to travel the 150 miles in four hours. Now you probably know how fast you have to go to go 150 miles in four hours. Is that all there was? Four hours? Doesn't seem like we're going very fast. How fast is that? We do 150, 150 miles in four hours. That's 75 in two hours. That's 37.5 miles per hour. How could that possibly be, he said. Well, we went 50 miles an hour here, and then we sit, sat still. So over those two hours, we only made 50 miles. That's 25 miles per hour. Here's another 25 miles per hour. And in the middle, we only did 75. So I didn't quite offset it. I think it's all right. I've got to make sure I got my distance right. Four hours, 150 miles. So that's 150 divided by four is 37. Check that out. It's true. It is true. So we know how to do that. Um, but we want to relate that to slope of line segments. So take a look at this. The slope of this segment here, I'm flying along like this. Well, you can see why, because it's the rise is 150 over the run is four hours. That's how we would compute it without thinking. So that just reinforces the thinking that the slope of the line segment is telling you the average rate of change as you travel between the two points. Traveling, literally, because if you're driving your car, you're actually traveling between two points. So there we go. Um, happy section 2.2, I think. Um, had some fun things to talk about, and I'm moving on to the next section. I hope you're with me, and I'll be talking to you soon.